first presentation under the management of people is about the role of HR, workforce planning and the recruitment and selection process. The learning intentions are to be able to understand the role of the HR department, to become aware of the concept of workforce planning, understanding the recruitment process and being able to distinguish between internal and external recruitment. HRM, Human Resource Management, as we know it, is responsible for bringing together all the elements of managing human resources. And the human resources in a business, that's the labour resource, that's the workforce of the business, and making sure that they fit together well. So they have a huge job to do because they are dealing with all the staff of the business. Um, it's concerned with making sure that the management of people fits in with the strategic objectives of the organisation. So the people have to understand what the organisation's strategic objectives are so that they can go with the business and they can support them. Now, the role of human resources can be um, learned in a number of ways, but this is probably the easiest way to do this. And it's through this mnemonic called FACES. So there are five roles that HR takes care of. The first one is they are the facilitator. Facilitating means helping other managers by putting systems into place and helping employees to acquire the skills and training, training needed. So what facilitating does is facilitating makes something easier. So the HR department are there to make sure that the different departments have got properly trained staff, they've got staff who fit into the organisation um, so that they are making the business's job easier. The second part, the A of this FACES mnemonic is auditor. And an audit is just a check. So what they are doing is they're monitoring the organisation to ensure things like policies, HR policies, employment legislation, etc., is being ad adhered to. So what that is, is that's just checking or auditing. The C of FACES stands for a consultancy role, the consultant. And what they're there to do really is they're there to provide managers in the different departments with assistance, with help in any matters to do with HR. For example, employees receiving warnings or perhaps employees who are not trained enough, who are being insubordinate, things like that. So the HR department will be there to provide some kind of consultancy role to these different departments. The E of FACES is executive. And what that really means is they're experts. The HR department are experts in all matters HR. So they'll make sure that all the policies and procedures are there and in line with legal requirements. So a little bit like auditor, the auditing's checking, but the executive role is they're making sure that the policies are in place to start with. Um, and they're, they're obviously in line with legal, legal requirements because the business doesn't want to be fined or you know, um, taken to court for anything like that. The final uh, part of this role of HR in FACES is a service role, the S is service. And what they're really there to do is providing any specialist service to the organisation. Anything useful, any information on HR, then they are there to be able to help to do that. It might be, for example, that they are perhaps dealing with employees who are looking for pay rises, etc. And what they would do is they would decide how they would go about that. They would maybe um, chat to other departments to see um, how they can actually motivate or reward their employees for things they've done. So this is... The next thing we look at as we look at workforce planning, the very, very first thing that the, org the HR department of organisations has to do is to have to make sure that they are prepared for the future and they plan their workforce ahead so that they are not left without staff. So the, the, the aim of workforce planning um, is to make sure that managers can meet the needs of the organisation as best they can by having the right workers in place at the right time. So they're really looking ahead to, to find out what their workforce is like, what's it made up of, who's it made up of, sorry, and when they think people are going to leave or retire or whatever, when departments are going to expand um, or maybe merge, needing more or less staff. And it's their job to plan ahead for this. Workforce planning aims to match suitably qualified and skilled employees to the aims of the organisation. 
It also incorporates business monitoring changes and trends in the labour market in order to analyse changes in employment patterns to benefit the needs of the business. So, for example, there may be jobs that are no longer required um, because uh, technology is taken over, for example, and an organisation knows that if a man, uh, an employee sorry, leaves that particular job, it will not need to be replaced because technology is now doing the job of the person. It could be, for example, that uh, there are maybe out there in the labour force not a suitably number, a suitable number of suitably uh, skilled employees, and they know that uh, that's maybe something that has to be dealt with. There may be uh, it happens all the time in teaching when there are times when perhaps there aren't enough trained staff um, to fill a particular subject. So, for example, recently there has been an issue with home economics, HR, HFT, and what's happened is universities have had to try to encourage people to go along to become HFT or home economics teachers by giving them incentives, financial incentives, perhaps uh, opening the net a little bit wider to allow different qualifications to get in now. And all of these things are what we call workforce planning, planning ahead so that they've maybe left it a little bit late, bit late because a lot of schools have had to decrease the size of their, H, uh, their HFT departments. But that's kind of workforce planning. It means that candidates, they're always on track to get the best candidates to work for them in the future. Now, this next slide here is a workforce planning diagram, which just really outlines the steps in, in workforce planning. So step number one is define the plan. What we really mean by that is just the business is setting its objectives. Business has to set its objectives before it knows what kind of staff it's going to need in the future. The second step at the bottom here is map the changes. So what you're really doing there is you're looking at the skills of your current workers and you're deciding what new skills you're going to need. So that's you mapping the changes. The third step here is defining the required workforce. So that really means you're looking to find what type of employees you're going to need with these new skills. What, where, where in the organisation are we going to need these workers with the new skills? Number four is understanding workforce availability. And all that really means is looking out there to see in the labour force or the labour market, what is the availability of workers with those particular skills? Stage number five is plan to deliver the required workforce. Now that means that you may have the you may have to employ these people, they may be partly trained, you may have to train them more. So the organization may have to have some form of training courses that these employees may have to go on to make sure that they are the required workforce as such. And then finally, step number six is to implement. These workers will then start doing the job and it's up to the organization to monitor and evaluate how these employees are actually getting on in the workforce. And this is really one of the ways in which we can plan workforce plan. Now the next two in the next slide here are a couple of videos on workforce planning which it would be useful to have a wee look at just to make you understand it a little bit more fully. There's never a particularly huge question in workforce planning, but it is important to um, have a bit of knowledge on it. What happens after the workforce planning and the organisation decides what labour they're going to require and what's out there, etc., is the whole implementing the workforce requires a recruitment and selection process. And recruitment and selection are two different aspects. They will not be asked alone, uh, sorry, together, they will be asked alone simply because the um, the question the, the question would be far, far too big. So the, the recruitment process by the HR department of an organisation is the process of trying to hire new employees, trying to get people to apply for jobs. And that's just what this slide says. Recruitment is when a business is actively trying to hire new employees. It involves encouraging people to apply for a job vacancy. It's important that the very best people are attracted to the job as they'll play an important role for the business. So it's really important that the recruitment process for the organisation is really robust. Recruiting the right person for the job is crucial as they are going to be responsible for a lot of different activities in the organisation. For example, you know, contributing towards business objectives. So they're basically helping the business to achieve what it wants to. Producing quality goods and providing high quality services. They have to be good staff to be able to do that. Interacting with customers, delivering good customer service. 
interacting and communicating with other stakeholders. We know back from the very first outcome, the very first unit, that there are lots and lots of stakeholders attached to a business, both internal and external. And the staff of an organisation, the employees and the managers, have to be able to interact and communicate with the stakeholders. The next slide, we're going to break this up um, over the course of the next few slides, is really just a little flowchart on the stages of the recruitment process. So if you're asked about the stages of a recruitment process in an exam, you would be expected to cover all of these areas. Um, so I'm just going to zoom on to the next slide and, and cover these. So the very first step is identifying a job vacancy. This means that the organisation is going to decide whether or not a job needs filled. So companies might be trying to downsize, which means that if an employee leaves, they're fired or they retire, there might not be a need to fill the job. They've decided that they're going to go with the staff they've got, in which case there will be no recruitment process. However, if there's a need to fill the job vacancy, um, as the duties carried out by a former member of staff can't be completed by um, existing staff just now, then there most certainly will be a recruitment process and this is where it begins. So the first stage, identifying a job vacancy. The second stage is preparing a job analysis. Now, this is where the HR department of an organisation literally sit and brainstorm the job. They simply write down everything about the job, everything at all from the amount they're going to be paid, where they're going to be working, the skills they have to have, any experience, the duties they're going to perform, the responsibilities. All of these things are going to be brainstormed by the organisation in something called a job analysis. Just what this slide says here, every time a role has to be filled within an organisation, a job analysis is carried out. This highlights key points such as the roles and responsibilities of the job, skills and qualifications required, who the candidate would be responsible for and accountable to. Um, and this will normally involve a brainstorming session by HR staff so they can come up with important information to lead to the next two steps, the preparation of two formal documents that are normally um, advertised with the job advert called a job description and a person spec. So first and foremost, the job description. This takes out the details from the job analysis to outline what the job actually entails. It allows potential candidates to understand exactly what the role within the organisation is, whether it suits them, whether they feel they can do it. And what this does is they create the job description to help attract the best possible candidates and to make sure that the candidates who are applying for the job are interested and they feel as though they fit the criteria. It includes information such as the job title, the hours they're going to work, main duties and responsibilities of the post holder, key tasks they'll have to carry out, for example, the authority they'll have over others, where the post holder may be working. All of these things are covered in this thing called a job description. Alongside that, a person specification is prepared and the person specification outlines the ideal candidate that the organisation would like to have. Four different features of the type of candidate, the ideal candidate the organisation would be looking for. Again, created to help attract the best possible candidates and to make sure that they're not faffing around with people who don't fit the criteria. Hopefully these people won't apply because they know they've not got the skills and qualities, etc. required. So the four main um, pieces of information that the person spec will contain will be the, the, skill, the qualifications required to fill the position, the skills and abilities of the, the, the employee, potential employees, their experience, previous experience, and any qualities they have. Now, these are going to list the qualities of the all of these things, the qualification, skills, um, qualities and experience of the ideal candidate. So it's up to the candidate to decide whether or not they fit these criteria. After those two documents are prepared, it's then time to decide where they're going to advertise the job. And the job can either be advertised internally, we call that internal recruitment, or externally. So internally, first, we're going to have a wee look here at um, some of the advantages and disadvantages of internal recruitment. Internal recruitment is when managers only advertise the job to people within the business, i.e. those who already work there. And some of the advantages are, this is obviously not exhaustive, the job can be filled quickly because it's a much, much shorter process because the person is being appointed from within. Money can be saved from external advertising the position and existing employees are familiar with the way the business works so will be able to fit in a lot quicker and perhaps require less training so it's more cost and time effective. 
However, disadvantages might be there might not be any existing employees who fit the role. The opportunity to gain new blood, new ideas is lost because the person is already going to be there. And recruiting internally means that another job is going to have to be filled within the organisation. So the recruitment process has to start again. As far as external recruitment is concerned, this is when managers advertise the job out with the business, attracting new candidates to apply for the job. Once again, advantages on the left here. People with new ideas can be brought in, which is really good. Recruitment agencies can make the job more efficient um, for the organisation. External recruitment agencies can attract larger numbers of applicants and they can have a really good choice of people to choose from. However, if existing employees apply and are unsuccessful, they might feel a little bit put out, a little bit hard done by because they've not been chosen and they feel a bit less motivated. It can be more expensive than recruiting internally, especially using recruitment agencies, so it can be very expensive. And there's always the chance of the wrong person being chosen because the business doesn't really know them very well. On this next slide, we've just got some methods of external recruitment, different ways in which you can do that. Some of these are a little bit more dated than others. Job centres still exist, recruitment agencies, as we spoke about there, advertising in newspapers, in schools and unis on their, maybe their careers notice boards, etc. Notice boards in the business to perhaps grab your internal candidates on websites, internet websites like s1jobs.com, Indeed, all these places, maybe local newspapers as well as national, perhaps passing word of mouth, we're looking for someone to fill a job if anyone knows of anyone. Any in-house magazines, the organisation, for example, Redfrewshire Council has an in-house magazine where jobs can be advertised. Um, and perhaps on TV, sometimes S1 jobs uh, do on TV and radio, you sometimes hear that they're looking for uh, employees for particular jobs. Um, this next slide here um, is just a video link for the recruitment process, just to explain it in a little bit more depth from, a, from another person. Moving on to the selection process now, the learning intentions here are to become aware of the selection process, distinguishing between different types of testing available and understanding the different types of training once an employee has been taken on and being able to compare them. So what's selection then? This is a whole new process in its own. This is when all the applications are received, the best person for the job is then selected. Now, in order to pick the best candidate, the business will check application forms thoroughly and references from employers and deciding to invite people back for the next stage. Now, we call this whole process here shortlisting. Shortlisting is picking the best candidate from their application forms and inviting them in for an interview. In some cases, it's normal procedure to carry out tests as well to help pick the best candidate. It tends to be that one method of selection isn't the one chosen. You tend to find there are a number of methods of, of selection. If you take, for example, the police force, where they use a number of different um, selection processes, the same can happen for a lot of other organisations. Um, so testing, we're going to look at just in a second. First and foremost, though, about interviews, there are different types of interviews that can be carried out. Telephone interviews tend to just be a kind of introductory kind of preliminary stage just to hear the person's voice, etc. Ask them a couple of questions. Video interviews have been used frequently during the pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic, when people couldn't actually meet face to face for interviews. Or it could be the candidate is maybe too far away in a video interview through Zoom or Skype or whatever's allowed. One to one interviews is where you are only being questioned by one interviewer. Panel interviews tend to be a lot more common. And this is when the interviewee the person being interviewed meets with a number of interviewers asking separate questions. And then we've got these things called group interviews, where a number of people are interviewed at the same time, normally more informally, perhaps maybe for part time jobs in shops, etc. In order to get the process done a little bit quicker, what they can do is they can invite a number of people along and judge by how they react to questioning, etc. if they are fit to perhaps go on to another stage. Advantages and disadvantages of interviews, then you can see the personality and appearance of the, the applicant. Um, the content of your application form or CV can be discussed in more depth with you. And the applicant gets a feel or an overview of the business and the job because they're maybe actually in the premises. 
However, they are time consuming to carry out, especially if you're interviewing a lot of candidates. That's why it's best to do a really good shortlist and get your numbers down. Some people can get nervous in an interview scenario and it doesn't really show the true person. So they might not, they might be great for the job, but they just don't come through in the interview. And there can be interview by interview bias, sorry. It could be, for example, that the interviews have all, interviewers have already made their, their, their mind up. That's why it's better to have a panel interview because you get more people there. Now, uh, this next slide here, these are covered in greater detail in your notes, these different testing selection uh, techniques, testing. And these are different um, ways in which uh, organisations can use tests to see if candidates fit the criteria. Intelligence tests are like IQ tests, um, asking you a number of questions to see if you can put things in order, etc. Nick's shape, all that sort of thing. Personality tests are really good if you're going to be working in a team because they know what type of person they want in there and that would take your personality test would be there. Psychological tests, asking you how you would react to different situations. Aptitude test, how good you are at something. So it could be a practical test or it could be, you know, asking you for an insurance company to go through an insurance form and, and check if you can see if the person's due to get a claim, finding out if you can actually do it. And attainment, once again, is quite similar to intelligence where you're actually trying to achieve something. These are all in more detail in pages 11 and 12 of your HR notes. Advantages and disadvantages then of testing. The content of the applicant's CV or application form can be confirmed if you say, for example, that you are medically fit or if you can do something or you're a certain type of person, they can see that from the test. It can provide information about applicants' personality and how they communicate and interact. As I said, making it easier to fit into the organisation. However, once again, these are really time consuming to carry out. They can be costly to the organisation because they maybe pay for some of these tests. And some people, once again, might not really cope with a test situation and might not show their true colours. Another uh, selection technique that can be used is an assessment centre. And this is where you're probably getting towards the end of your process. And you could be really shortlisted. You could be one of a few remaining candidates. And an organisation can have an assessment centre set up in their organisation where they will have a kind of work, a real life situation type thing, where you may be asked to listen to phone calls, interact with people, depending on what the job's actually asking. And people are there to... Um, check how you're doing. So some organisations use them to allow them to uh, see a number of candidates at the one time. You can take part in a variety of team building tasks, tests, etc. And they can see how suitable you are for a job and how you interact with people. And that will give them a better idea of how you react if you were actually in the job. The good things about them is you can be scrutinised over a period of time. It could be a day or a few days. Um, how you interact with others can be assessed, which is really important as well. And this is another step, so reduces the chance of interview bias. However, they are expensive to run assessment centres for organisations. Uh, careful planning and preparation is required to make sure that the assessment centre runs smoothly on those days. And of course, staff are required to keep an eye on the candidates, which is losing production time. They're, they're missing out on the job that they would normally. References are another selection technique um, that are normally a report and an evaluation from a previous employer, a school or a college about a particular person. The references normally include details, think about your experience, your ability, your attendance records, any training records, skills and qualities you've got. And they're just something else to help you along the way. Now, this next slide is actually a task asking you to look at a website uh, showing you, in order to become a police officer, what different selection techniques do they use um, to, to uh, test, etc., for you to be, um, become a police officer. So that might be worth doing. When all of this is done and the person has been offered the job, they will then receive a contract of employment. Now, this is by law. The Contracts of Employment Act means that you have to have a contract within 13 weeks of starting work. And your contract of employment just lists a lot of things like your hours of work, the rate of pay or salary you're going to get, your, if you're part of the pension scheme, how that works out, notice required if you're going to move to another job, your job title, any holiday entitlement, what happens if you're off sick, any disciplinaries or grievance procedures, and when your employment begins. Uh, so that, that has been uh, workforce planning and the recruitment and selection process. Thank you.